Hello, I'm Adiola Adejobi, along with my co-host, Jason Clark, and I want to welcome you to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. The Metropolitan Black Bar Association is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. Our mission is to advance equality in the pursuit of justice, assist in the professional development of our members, and address legal issues affecting New Yorkers. The goal of Raising the Bar with the MBBA is to foster a substantive conversation about justice issues in our community while also identifying few solutions. Today, we're going to look into the role that civic engagement plays in preparing our children for civic participation in our society. Joining me now is Denora Gattaccio, New York City Executive Director for Generation Citizen, and Joe Rogers, the Director of Public Engagement and Government Affairs at the Center for Educational Equity at Teachers College, Columbia University. Welcome. Yes, welcome both of you, and thanks for joining us. So this is a, a topic that I think a lot of people are very interested in, especially when it comes to um, education and you know preparing that next generation of uh, of leaders out there. Um, but a lot of times, people feel like civic uh, engagement, civic participation, actually isn't in our schools anymore. Isn't something that people are being taught about. So you know, just to frame the conversation, Joe. Um, what can you tell us about what someone's legal rights are to civic engagement? First of all, thank you so much for having me on today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will tell you, for, first of all, it's really important that we think about the entire package of opportunities that young people are entitled to under the law. For about 10, 15 years at least, we've been focused exclusively on college and career readiness. Right? We use that phrase ad, ad nauseum in research and schools and among policymakers, and yet, it's like, you know, this morning I went to the gym. You know, I worked out pretty hard, but I only worked my upper body, right? And you can see, I don't know if you can see on the camera there, I kind of have those sort of skinny legs, right? <laughs> if you work one part of your body and you leave the other one to atrophy or not to, not to fully develop, you're going to be lopsided, you're going to be a little off balance, there's going to be something wrong. So the same way in education, we can focus on preparing our young people for college, right, to get into higher ed, we want that for our young people, to get a great job, right, our young people deserve that. And yet we haven't focused on this other aspect of New York students' constitutional right to adequate preparation for capable civic participation. Right. What does that mean, right? So it's really jobs, higher ed, and then preparation to play an active and effective role in shaping and leading our democracy. And so most educators, most parents, most students, most folks, uh, lawyers actually, have talked to a lot of lawyers who are unaware of this constitutional right under the New York State Constitution. So we're trying to do a better job of raising awareness about it, but not only talking about it, actually making sure that in all of our schools, uh, all of our young people have the full set of opportunities to prepare to play the active role in our democracy. And I would say, so then, let's say someone watches this show and they hear what you're saying and they feel like, you know, they've gone over their children's curriculum in school and they don't see this. What are they supposed to do next? I think the first step is to make sure that you're fully aware of what uh, these complement, this complement of resources to which our young people are entitled. And it's not just this broad general right. In the Court of Appeals decision in 2006, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but parents and community members filed a major lawsuit in 1993 here in New York State against our state government for its failure to provide even the basic opportunities, basic educational opportunities to which young people are entitled. Ultimately, right, let's jump ahead. In 2006, the Court of Appeals, the highest court in our land, said, you New York State government, you are violating the Constitution by failing to provide resources in these particular categories. And among them are qualified and well-supported, effective personnel, uh, instrumentalities of learning. We use a lot of legal jargon. Really, that means the things you need, the things that teachers need and, and students need in order to fully take advantage of all the educational opportunities, an appropriate and up-to-date curriculum, um, and additional supports for English language learners and students with disabilities, uh, among uh, there are several others there. So you need to inform yourselves. I think parents and young people, those we've worked with, are really excited to learn about uh, these guarantees in our in New York State law that no one's sharing with them. Uh, right? Policymakers haven't shared it. Uh, the state government hasn't shared 
the things for which we should be holding them accountable. And so it's really important that people educate themselves. And we have some resources that I'll talk about later that will help them learn specifically what should be available in all of our schools. Yeah, and has there been any backlash from schools that say, well, we don't have enough resources to cover this? Have you heard of anything like that? Absolutely, yeah. We've done extensive research, including a statewide study in the 2011-2012 school year, and then a more recent pilot study here in New York City and in uh, three nearby suburban schools, some of them uh, well-resourced, some sort of with average level of resources, some uh, not well-resourced at all. And so they're saying they don't have enough staff to provide, we're not just talking about civics courses, right? Let's, let's be very clear about this. We're talking about additional tutoring for young people who are not meeting basic proficiency standards in English, math, science, and social studies. It's not just the courses, right? If you can't write, if you can't read, if you can't conduct research, right, and articulate a coherent and persuasive argument, you're not going to succeed in our democracy. Your voice will not be heard uh, loud and clear in the way that it needs to be. And so, yeah, a lot of the schools that we've interviewed, we have confidentiality agreements with them so they can tell us we're failing to provide this resource, we're not providing these personnel, students' rights are being violated. Um, and so the young people and the parents are completely unaware and we tried to do our best to democratize the research, to make it accessible in user-friendly formats to those who may not have a JD, right? right. Or may not have a policy degree uh, from wh whichever school. Because in order to exercise your rights, uh, you must be well-informed. Right. And that's really where it starts for us. You know, and I would just jump in to say on that, and thanks for having me on the show today as well. Um, as the largest action civics provider in the state, but also nationwide, um, what we find is when we talk to educators, it's not that they don't want to be teaching civics in the classroom. The curriculum and the framework standards they're getting from the state, where we do have at least a mandate on the books that all students are supposed to get civics, is rote memorization, right? So it's like, great, I, I grew up at a time when Schoolhouse Rock was in, and we all know what that is, and we could sing the song. In a 21st century democracy, when young people can like and hug and retweet things on the internet, that doesn't resonate with them, right? And so when we talk to educators and to parents, what they find is that when they learn about our curriculum, that it's student-led, that it's project-based, and that it's action-oriented, students actually get to be in the driver's seat of understanding how government relates to them on issues that matter to them, then they are interested and they're excited. Right. And so I think the biggest hurdle, honestly, is for educators and administrators to have the resources to be able to train teachers to teach effective civics education in the classroom and not just, I'm just, I'm a bill on Capitol Hill, right? Like, we have to get past that in a 21st century democracy. Right, right. speaking and of the 21st century, um, how are we bridging that gap between the lack of resources that you're talking about and some of the strategies that mm -hmm. you're talking about in terms of um, making sure the students are engaged? It's a great question. I bet you know an active conversation in Albany right now as they try to finalize the budget before the end of March. Uh, the reality is, the, as Joe mentioned, the litigation that called for more fair student funding, we still hadn't gotten the money we need into the most under-resourced districts. And so when you compare that with the fact that a majority of students who live in underserved communities are not getting effective civics education, meaning they're less likely to have debates in their classroom about real world issues, understand how government relates to them, that means we're continuing the civic engagement gap plaguing our underserved communities. Our problem is not the interest or desire, right? On the one hand, you have educators who will say, oh, I don't even have a, my own civics education with all due respect, right? Like, I don't remember how this works. On the other hand, they're saying, no one's ever given me professional development to do this work right. or to assess student learning on the back end. And so as that debate is live in Albany, we want to continue to push for meaningful resources to be allocated to those most needy districts, be them urban, like New York City, where there are 1.1 million students, or in rural communities of state, because all of those students need to be able to have effective civics, not just the ones who live in afflu affluent neighborhoods. All right, and to, uh, you know, the thing that's interesting about uh, this conversation is usually people are trying to reform the law in some type of way. But in this circumstance, we have the New York State Constitution. We have a uh, New York State Court of Appeals, which is the highest state court in New York, uh, essentially affirming what needs to be done. But it's act, but people like yourself, Generation Citizen, our schools, the Center for Education Equity, we aren't getting the resources. So. We need to do more to try to make sure you get those resources, but what are some of the things you guys are doing to make sure that, um, uh, that students are getting a civic, uh, uh, civic education? 
I think, uh, Jason, a great question. So one of the things we need to think about is, uh, for many years, you know, we got the, the CFE, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity versus State of New York. We got that decision in 2006. The government, our legislature, the governor, dec decided to allocate additional funds broadly to try to address that. And yet today, we're not seeing the returns. We're not seeing a sufficient or adequate level of opportunities in our schools, particularly those serving black and brown children, but also other children who are living in poverty. And so one of the things we need to make sure we do is that, um, is that we educate folks about the right and again about the specific resources that are required because even if the money flows from CFE and it's not allocated for, for adequate civic education, but it's, we create all kinds of other programs that maybe aren't required, right. that aren't going to help us fulfill this commitment to our young people to prepare them for active participation in our democracy, we have failed, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just the amount of money, right? It's not just the legal solution, not just the litigation. It really requires a democratic solution, right? De democratic education requires a democratic process in which we come together and make this a, a priority. This is a policy priority. It's really, uh, you know, it's life or death for our democracy. That's what it is at the end of the day. And so how do we make sure working with, you know, for example, there's this uh, Democracy Ready New York coalition that we at the Center for Educational Equity began bringing together, and which Generation Citizen is a, a, a fundamental um, uh, leading member. And we need to make sure that, you know, we include the voices of those who are most affected. I'll tell you, I've been in a lot of these spaces where decisions about civics education are being made, whether they're conferences or symposia, you know, really el elite spaces. You don't, you have very few young people, very few people of color, uh, never mind sort of black lawyers. We need more black lawyers. We, we need to do a better job of bringing black lawyers to the table. We have one, but there's a critical role for MBBA members, and I think it's so wonderful that Jason Clark uh, uh, has, has joined uh, and is playing an active role in that work as well. But it really takes an intentional effort to make sure that those who, uh, who, not, those who are underserved those who have been marginalized for democracy are at the table. Mm -hmm. And the Democracy Ready New York Coalition, which you can learn more about at democracyreadynewyork.org, is one way to learn about this work of good government groups, educational equity mm -hmm. organizations, and uh, civics educators, civic educators who are doing the work in schools and in communities who have come together for the first time ever in a powerful way to guide the state toward realizing its commitment. Okay. I don't know if you know the Every Student Succeeds Act. Mm -hmm. Right? Our, our state submitted to the federal government a proposal, a plan, they were required to submit. What they weren't required to do is insert a placeholder for a civic readiness index. Mm -hmm. right? They now have a college, career, and civic readiness index. Mm -hmm. What does civic readiness mean? What is the state's interpretation of civic readiness and what all young people should be prepared to do? They're not quite sure yet. And so the role of this coalition, again, Democracy Ready New York, the role of this official State Education Department Civic Readiness Task Force on which both Denora and I serve, uh, we're, we're thinking about that. But again, it's about inclusive voices, making sure people are aware and that the right people are at the table. Right, right. Great. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I guess even to that point, uh, you know, when we're talking about uh, civic edu uh, education, I mean, I think we're really at a time where, at least in my lifetime, uh, there's so many more people who, uh, just generally, but students and young folks specifically, seem to be want to know how to get more engaged, mm -hmm. okay. and they want to do something. And I would just think that the more we can actually be, be, make sure that they have the skills to be able to do so, we can empower them to be that next generation of leaders. So, uh, Denor, I know there are a lot of uh, terrific things that uh, Generation uh, Citizen has been doing. So, what are some of the things that uh, your organization is doing that maybe some of our other organizations can also be doing to, you know, add to this uh, initiative? No, I appreciate that. And you know, the reality is, I've coined it a civic awakening or reckoning. Right? We realize that if you don't prepare people for participation, we're going to have a democracy that is not reflective of our citizenship. I mean, our citizenry or responsive. Right? So there was even a. I was, I was surprised on Friday. There was a Fox News contributor who said uh, that if you don't prepare people through civic education education, you're going to have a tyranny of the ungoverned. And I was like, wait, we all need to share that. Because that was the fundamental reason that our founders created our education system. It was to teach people about democracy. And we've lost sight of that. So I'm excited and so proud to lead Generation Citizens New York City region, because that's what we're doing. We're going into middle and high school classrooms and really giving young people, as you said, the skills, the knowledge, and hopefully motivating them for lifelong participation. Yes, I want them to tweet and like and hug things on the internet. <laughs> 
I also want them to advocate in support of or against legislation or to get petitions or to organize their, co their classmates around an issue. And that's the work that we're doing in the classroom is really getting young people to find their civic voice grounded in what, me what matters to them. So I'll give you an example uh, from the classroom. We had last fall a group of young ladies at a school in Brooklyn who were focused on the lack of monuments in Brooklyn that reflected women of color, right? You have all, or women period even, but especially women of color. And so they wrote to City Hall and said, you know, the, I heard the mayor's convening a task force on this issue. How come we haven't been consulted as residents of downtown Brooklyn? Why aren't our voices being heard as young women, which is for me incredibly powerful. It's like, yeah. yes, young women are gonna lead all the time. Um, and they wrote to City Hall, they wrote an op-ed that got published in City Limits, and they were advocating to make their voices heard. That doesn't happen in a traditional public school classroom, right? Young people aren't being told that their voices matter. And I'll be honest, right, when we start our semester off and we go work with the students, we work with grades 6 through 12, very often they're looking at Generation Citizen and the, either the college volunteers we bring into the classroom or their teacher and saying, who brought this program here? But once they realize that it's focused on them and that it's student-led and it's project-based, so the exact opposite of everything they're doing in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis, then their voices, they like realize they have a voice and they spark up. They're like, wait, you want to hear what I have to say? Oh, wait, I can call an elected official during class time and advocate on behalf of an issue? Then their voice comes to life, right? So to me, the most important thing is to make sure that young people are getting that core knowledge and skills in the classroom to get them motivated longer term. But most importantly, they need civic pathways. There are lots of opportunities here in New York City for students to become and continue to stay engaged beyond the classroom. We need to be plugging our youth into that, especially our people of color who come from underserved communities. They are the very young people who need to be advocating to government for the things that their communities need. And so we have a young, uh, a civic internship program over the summer. Where we're placing young people in paid internships in government and elected officials offices so that they realize that civics isn't just for the classroom. It's for the neighborhood. It's for the work that they continue to do. And it's not just in one aspect of your life. There are also youth who can serve on community boards if they're 16 or 17 years old, but many boards don't reflect that or not even inviting them to the table. And so it's like, how do we connect those dots? Right, yeah, and, uh, and to that point, I mean, I guess what's interesting to me, you know, I'm thinking about, let's say I'm a student, or actually, let's take that back. Let's say I am a teacher, mm -hmm. and I'm listening to this, and I'm like, well, this is great, I want to do this. You know, I, I work at a, uh, let's say, an underperforming, an underserviced uh, school district, and, uh, you know, Generation Citizen, I imagine, can't service everybody, but let's say I'm a teacher in this school, you know, what can I be doing to make sure that we have student-led projects, or what can I be doing to make sure that I'm providing this to my students mm -hmm. even if it's not something that's necessary within the infrastructure of my uh, education system. Well I'm gonna have to put in a plug first for Generation <laughs> Citizen so visit our website at generationcitizen.org. Um, we do want to work with more schools to be making sure we're providing professional development to teachers to teach action civics in the classroom but the great news is is that Mayor de Blasio has been talking about this also right so he has the Civics for All initiative where his goal is to be able to train all teachers to teach action civics in the classroom by the end of the 21 school year let's talk make sure that the DOE is doing that let's hold the DOE accountable to providing updated curriculum and resources and to providing community-based organizations like Generation Citizen an opportunity to train more teachers to get a real meaningful civics education uh, curriculum in the classrooms mm -hmm. I think too if I can just in. I think we need to also have a historical context, like just building on one, some of the things that um, Denora noted about there's a hunger for this, right? Whether it's among educators, among young people who are perfectly capable, right? We often we use this deficit lens to describe our young people, particularly black and brown young people in communities saying, I've heard someone, someone said, uh, actually I read this yesterday, there's uh, civic ignorance is rampant among black and brown students, something like that using some, uh, I think it was NAEP scores perhaps, oh and uh, I had to correct that. And so we need to have these kinds of conversations so we're not stigmatizing right. and further right. Right. Uh, you know, placing our young people in this inferior, box of inferiority. Right. They're, they're hot on social media, right? They have a passion for justice, yeah. many of our young people. They've experienced some of the hardship, some of the ways in which democracy and democratic institutions do not meet their needs. Okay. So they are, they are excited, they are hungry. But I think we also have to think about, you know, this isn't a new thing, right? right? The uh, experiential learning, uh, advocating for your community among young people. Think about freedom schools, right. right? Think about in many schools across the country here in New York, youth participatory action research. Mm -hmm. It's an approach in which young people conduct research, they identify an issue, they conduct research, they come up with a plan, and they try to mobilize people. We have an amazing and great tradition, particularly among black and brown 
uh, dominated schools and community institutions of help supporting our young people in this way. And so there are various ways to do it. I think we need to make sure that we, in the interest of sort of Sankofa, I think you all know, right? <laughs> yeah. We gotta look back <laughs> right. in order to look right. forward. Exactly. Let's look at what we've already done and what we're doing yeah. because there are schools in New York City and around this state that are doing, have exemplary practices. Yeah. They've made a commitment. They're doing the best they can with what little resources they have. Right. They could do so more if they received additional professional development, yeah. additional resources for staff. I just think of uh, just one more example from our recent research study. We looked at the availability of civic preparation resources in schools again here in New York yeah. City and in, in nearby suburbs. And there's a social worker who is responsible for conducting the community service program, project, right? Getting young people involved in their community who also had a huge load, a professional load as a social worker to meet the social, emotional, and other needs of those students, students with disabilities and other students in the school. That's unfair. Yeah. That's unfair to the young, to the to educators, of course, and to the social workers and other staff who are overburdened, but ultimately it's unfair to our young people who are not fully supported, despite the best uh, of intentions of their educators and this commitment and this, this sort of excitement around getting involved. Right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And I think what's interesting is we, right, we, Joe talked initially about the kind of over tilting towards, towards uh, test-based learning, right? Mm -hmm. And we recently saw in Albany some movement around reducing tenure restrictions that are connected to outcomes of students, right? So we don't want to go all the way the other direction. But if you allow more flexibility for how teachers gain tenure that's not just driven by did Johnny do really well on this standardized test, right. guess what happens? It creates more space for project-based learning, right? So the teacher can have more flexibility to bring in curriculums that allow for project-based and student-led learning. And that's a win for democracy and it's a win for our education system. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It's amazing. And then uh, I know one of the things we had uh, talked about um, before just in some of our previous conversation is how, uh, you know, the results of, of, of uh, civic engagement uh, when you're learning those in your schools. I mean, whether it's talking about voting or mm -hmm. some others, like what, and I guess, um, talk to us a little bit about the role that that could have on uh, voter participation as well as some of these other things that I think people could wrap their, their brains about as to why this is important. Yeah. Um, and so the research shows out of Circle up at Tufts University that there are three key uh, metrics to track long-term civic participation of young people um, when you think about effective civics education. First is, are students gaining core civic knowledge? Do they understand the branches of government, how government's structured? And at Generation Citizen, we focus on the state and local level. Um, do they have civic skills, right? So do they know who they're calling, what elected official has oversight or is the decision maker on an issue, and what they're asking them to do? So if you have a pothole in your community, you're not calling the mayor, right? you're calling the Department of Transportation and you're asking for funding to fix that pothole. And then the, do they have civic motivation, right? So do they understand that if they know who to call, who the decision maker is, what they're asking for, do they think it would matter to actually do that, to take those steps? Um, through our programming, we track the, the increases in civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions over the course of the semester um, as, as a way to understand whether or not students have gained that core information and whether or not they'd be more likely to participate long term. Uh, we are a growing and kind of adolescent nonprofit, so we don't have all the longitudinal data at our disposal yet, but what we do see is that our young people are taking that next step, right? So either through our summer internship program or wanting to be able to vote or to participate on community boards or join youth advisory councils. Right, and I think that's, you know, very uh, critical and, and important information. So New York City generally is very progressive, but there is, uh, voter turnout is really low. Can you all talk about, you know, Maybe some, maybe some from your research or some of the things that you've seen that connects those two things. Like how, how do those two things work together? I just say, I mean, if if you don't know, I mean, to Denora's point, if you don't know how <laughs> government works, you don't know who your elected officials are and the other decision makers, formal decision makers in your in your community, right. and you're not inspired, encouraged, right, led. Uh, you don't have the sense of agency about your own participation, your ability to affect change in your community on the issues that affect you most, you're not going to participate. Mm -hmm. And so we see that in certain communities where the voting participation is much higher, generally, right, there's a very strong correlation between the level of education mm -hmm. and voter turnout, right. right, participation in our electoral system. Mm -hmm. And so we need experiential, hands-on civic learning, be it action civics or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, however you phrase it. But we also need to make sure that our young people, again, this is, this is fundamentally important, are fully prepared in English, mm -hmm. right? 
to read and write. Yeah. Right. They're fully prepared to conduct research, right. right, which is an important civic skill. Yeah. Right. Being able to consult multiple sources of information, yeah. different news sources, not just your go-to or whatever, your, your, maybe your parents or you know, someone you look up to or it's what someone else posts on a social media page right. thinks is important. You need to be able to develop your own well-informed mm -hmm. opinions right. and arguments yeah. to advance your own uh, political and social agenda uh, and, and issues. And so, you know, again, if we focus, we can't focus solely on expanding those things that come under more formally or explicitly civic education or civic participation. Mm -hmm. right. We need to make sure that we get the fundamentals down. Not just because it's, they're tested, but because if you can't read or write, if you can't do math, right, right to look at statistics mm -hmm. about your community to help right. you make an informed decision about that ballot proposal, mm -hmm. right? That was actually one of the specific examples cited in the Court of Appeals uh, decision in the Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit. The judge actually looked at, read a ballot proposal, uh, and uh, there, there's some complex math there. You'd have to do, understand statistics, right, state policy, in order to be able to vote um, in an informed way. Right. And ultimately decided, thank goodness, right, the state was arguing that you only need an eighth grade level education. Our state government, New York State's government argued this in the court of law. Mm -hmm. You only need an eighth grade level of math, English, and so on in order to participate effectively, to be a capable civic participant. Thank goodness that parents and young people, communities, and lawyers won the day, right? And the Court of Appeals said, you're wrong, state government. Eighth grade isn't enough. We need a 12th grade level mm -hmm. of functioning, of profi at least proficiency right. in each of these core academic subjects right. and in, uh, more broadly in you know, college and career and civic preparation. Yeah, so, and I'm sorry. glad you actually uh, brought that up because I think uh, you know, New York City, um, very different than a lot of other states and things like that, there's a lot of different ways that people can participate. Like even when you think right. about community yeah. boards, right. you know, people might live right next to where meetings are happening right. and have no idea that, that they're going on and don't know how to participate. Right, you know, or, or from Porter, there's so many other ways we can do so. Yeah. Uh, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, even though there's so much more we want to talk about. Uh, I want to thank you, Joe. I want to thank you, Denor, for thank coming you. with, uh, joining us today. Hopefully you'll uh, join us again. Yes, and thank you for watching Raising the Bar with the MBBA. To watch our other shows, you can visit MNN.org. Until next time, goodbye.